for this morning. I hope that uh, the service is both encouraging and challenging uh, to you this morning, spiritually speaking. So glad that you're here. All right, so I might be telling my age, or maybe not, I don't know, but do you know who this is? Ever seen him before? That is Dudley Do-Right of the Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, he first appeared uh, in Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons in 1959. He's the good guy. He's the one that we look to. Then there's always the bad guy. This is Snidely Whiplash. Whenever we watch cartoons, hear stories, watch movies, we look for the good guy. Because in one way or another, he's who we maybe aspire to be. He is the one teaching the lessons. He is the one that we look to, oftentimes as an example. And this includes Scripture. When we look in Scripture, we look at Jesus. We look at Peter and Paul. We look at King David. And we learn from their good, heroic acts. We don't ever look at the snidely whiplashes of literature, of history, and say, I can learn something from him, but that's not the case this morning, because this morning we're going to be learning from Judas. The one who betrayed our Lord and Savior for 30 pieces of silver. The one that we might look at and just shake our heads at. How could someone do anything like that? Well, this morning, we're going to learn a great deal from Judas. First off, Judas fulfilled a prophecy. Let's look at John chapter 13, please. John chapter 13, verses 18 and 19. In this chapter, Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. Judas was there, he is teaching a lesson to the disciples about humility, about being a servant. And we read in verses 18 and 19 of John chapter 13, I do not speak of all of you, I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am He. Truly, truly, I say to you, He who receives, whomever I send receives me, and who receives me receives Him who sent me. So here Jesus is telling His disciples, look, there is a prophecy that was spoken of, and it's in Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9, and that's what Jesus quotes in verse 18. Someone is going to be against me. It was prophesied there, and Jesus speaks of it. Now, Jesus here, he did not make Judas betray him. That's what a lot of atheists might try to say, or other types who, who say, well, you know, Judas, or we're made to do things. No, we have free will, you see. But God, in his knowledge, and his foreknowledge, could foresee that Judas was going to do this. Parents, we have foreknowledge, right, to a degree. You're in the kitchen, perhaps, and you see your young son come in and grab the spatula and start walking down the hallway. If he's got a little brother, Jr. if he's got a little brother, you can probably guess what he might be doing with that. You're going to hit your little brother. Maybe he was, but you knew that. You knew what was going on. You could foresee that. It doesn't take much, a lot of times, to know the heart of someone. You watch them closely for three years, as Jesus did. You know what they're going to do. We're around people. We know how someone's going to act. We know what they're going to do. But certainly in God's imminent, uh, perfect foreknowledge, he would know and understand that Judas was going to do this. If it wasn't Judas, it would have it would have been someone else. There would have been another way, another avenue that Jesus would have been betrayed. But it happens here where Judas fulfills this prophecy. From Judas we also learn that there is something in a name. Your name is important to you and as you grow up, you know, you probably take even greater pride in that name. Well, this is definitely one of the lessons that we learn from Judas 
We name our sons Timothy. We name them Jacob, don't we? We don't name them Judas. We name our daughters Elizabeth. We name them Ruth and Mary. We don't name them Jezebel. Because there is something in a name. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 1 says this, A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. You protect your name, do you not? Whenever you work so hard to maintain a good image in your community, at work, at school, you don't want that name to be tainted. You want to be someone who, who's looked good upon, right? Because you are a follower of Christ, that's one of the reasons you want to do that, but you want your name to be one where people speak well of you. It is important that children of God wear the name Christian rather, rather than other names they might be called, Acts eleven twenty six. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. You have your personal name, but you are also a bearer of the name Christian. And hopefully you wear that name well. Hopefully you show others what a Christian should be like. Judas was wearing the name as a follower of Christ for sure, for sure as a disciple. But then he tainted that name. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven, that being the name Jesus, that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Our names are very important. And when people say your name, whenever they, they talk about you, hopefully it's with good intent, it's with good purpose. For there is truly something in a name. We also learn from Judas that disciples can fall. Let's look at John chapter 6, please. John chapter 6, verses 66 through 70. There are men, many that contend today that a, a disciple cannot fall, that you cannot, you cannot fall from grace. One who becomes a Christian uh, cannot you know, be destined for hell, you know, they, that, they, that that does not happen. However, we see through Judas that someone who walked with Jesus Christ on this earth and fall from where he was. John chapter 6 and verse 66. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So in the physical nature of Jesus, when he was here on this earth, there were disciples, not just the twelve, but there were others who were following him. And you know what? They, they withdrew. They weren't with Jesus anymore. So who were they with? They weren't with Jesus had to be with someone else, had to be with another, with another doctrine, with another group, with Satan perhaps, because you're not with Jesus when you're not following Him. You have fallen away from that. Verse, 50, verse 67. So Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered Him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. These other disciples decided they didn't want to sacrifice for Jesus, but Peter and the others at that time saw the value in following Jesus. We're not going to follow anyone else. Who are we going to go to? It's difficult sometimes. We know that as Christians. But who else are we going to go to? You're turning to somebody else if you're not following Jesus. If you're not a faithful child of His, if you're not studying if you're not worshiping Him on a regular basis, you're following someone else. For there were disciples here in the New Testament who said, I can't take this much Jesus anymore. And they left Him. They fell away. And Judas, we know, eventually does this as well. Verse 69, We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet, one of you is a devil. One of you is going to leave me. One of you is a devil. One of you does not have the heart that I am trying to instill in you. 
One of you has made a decision that's going to go against me. In life, there are many ways that one can live, but as we look to Scripture, there's only two. There's following Jesus or there's following Satan. Luke chapter 22 and verse 3 says, Satan entered into Judas. Finally going to carry out his plan that he had been developing. And this, as we'll see in a little while, has been growing in Judas now for quite some time. Our disciples today, you as a disciple of Christ, if you are a Christian, if you have been baptized into his body, need to be careful because of passages like this. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands Take heed that he does not fall. Are you sure you're a faithful child of God? Are you sure you're doing all that you can? Or are you just kind of peeking through the curtains at Jesus every now and then? Or are you allowing him to fully be in your life? That's what Romans 12, 1 and 2 means when it talks about being a living sacrifice. One that's totally devoted to to living for Christ, not just occasionally, not just when it's convenient, but at all times. Hebrews 3.12, Take care, brethren, that there be not in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Who was the Hebrew writer writing to at this time? He wasn't writing to atheists. He was writing to people who had given their lives to Christ. And what does he tell them? He says, Be careful that you not fall away from the living God. And this is what happened to Judas. This is what can happen to us today. Our camp is next week. We may have some young people devote their lives to Christ while they're there and become Christians and be baptized into the body of Christ. Pray that that might happen, especially if there's a young person that's on your mind that you're concerned about. Pray that that'll be a life-changing moment for them. But that's just where the journey begins. Because it is after that that you can stray from the path, that you can do other things, that you can fall away from following Jesus Christ, just as Judas did. We also learn from Judas about the vice of wrong motives. John chapter 12, I've preached on a few times over the last few weeks. We learn that Mary, who anointed the feet of Jesus with perfume and wiped them with her hair and his feet, Jesus, or Judas rather, said that this could have been sold for 300 denarii and the money. It could have been given to the poor. Why is she wasting this perfume? As we talked about a few weeks ago when when his head was anointed with oil, that 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 was for him to be honored, to be memorialized, and he memorialized Mary. John chapter 12 and verse 6 tells us that Judas was not concerned about the poor. But he did this because he was a thief. That's where his motive was. You see, a a person who says they're following Christ can have different motives. And it's difficult sometimes to know a person's heart. Jesus Jesus Christ, of course, knew Judas' heart and where he was. And the writer, Brother John here, through the Holy Spirit's inspiration, knew that Judas... He wasn't concerned about the poor. He was simply a thief. So you can have wrong motives. You can be in the right place, but for the wrong reasons. And Judas, we know, influenced the other disciples to think the same way. And this caused murmuring among them, no doubt. This caused their hearts to be in the wrong place until Jesus could correct them. So because Judas had these bad motives, he's influencing the disciples. Yeah, you know what? Judas is right, but then Jesus corrects them. The poor you'll always have with you, but you will not always have me. It is a danger for us today to have wrong motives if we're not careful. Another time Judas had a wrong motive, rather than all the obvious ones, was whenever he kissed Jesus. This would have been a a common way to show that you loved and appreciated someone at the time, but the motive at that moment was to betray Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches on motives. If you'd like to be turning there. Matthew chapter 6, we learn about the motives 
that Jesus our Lord warns against. Because you're here this morning and you go on, on, on youth outings, you go on other activities, you're in Bible class, you interact with us, perhaps you're in a leadership position, one must consider their motives. What are you really getting out of it? Hopefully it's the right things. Hopefully it's good things, rather than how Judas was being a thief in his position. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men, to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So sometimes we might come here to be noticed by people. How we dress, how we act, what we can get out of being here socially, you know, that's between you and God. But that's an impure motive. Verse 2, So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But do you give to be noticed by men? I, I certainly hope not. Verse 5, when you pray, <clears throat> you are not to be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Whenever you pray, especially gentlemen, whenever we pray in a public sense, do we aspire to have more pats on the back? Or do we aspire to guide people's minds in thinking about righteous things? Verse 7, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Sometimes you can say more with less. Sometimes you can be in a state of mind that you think, as the Gentiles were apparently, that the more I say, the, the more I'll be looked up to as, a, as, an honorable, as an honorable Christian. You're doing that with the wrong motives. You're doing it to be seen by men rather than by God. And you see, it is one person with a wrong motive who can create a lot of chaos in a congregation as they go after what it is they want, as they go after power, as they are maybe greedy, as they go after prestige to rise maybe to the top in the church, to be seen as a great, as a great person in the kingdom of God. There can be wrong motives there. There can always be wrong motives in a person's heart, and you've got to be careful of that because you can be caught up in the honor that, that comes with serving Christ. There certainly is. But a lot of times you've got to fight that off. A very, very great speaker in our brotherhood. I won't mention his name because he won't want me to. But he has spoken in front of thousands of people. And he'll leave when he's done. He'll walk out. Because he doesn't want everybody to come up and tell him what a great job he did. You know, he wants people to see the message. He wants them to see Christ. And I pray every day that that's who you see when I am up here. That you see the message. Because a man, a man might fail you. A man might not come through with, with what he says sometimes. Because we're all human. But as long as we have the right motives, Christ will be at the forefront of all. Galatians 5.26, let us not become boastful challenging one another, envying one another. Let us not be at one another's throat trying to rise to the top because we're greedy or because we're power hungry. But rather, let's try to push and uplift Christ in every way that we can. And then things will always work out for the better. Next, we learn to watch our opportunities. Judas had the same opportunities as the other disciples especially the other 11, but he wasted them. He wasted his opportunities and he allowed his heart to become evil. He heard the same lessons, watched the same miracles, listened to the same Lord, slept in the same spots, ate the same food, and yet his outcome was very, very different. And that happens even within our, our buildings. Every Sunday, they're the same people hearing the same lessons, and two people might go in very different directions. 
In Proverbs chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, the writer here is speaking of the harlot and her evil ways. And he says here, Now therefore, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. An an evil person, basically. Do not let an evil person get into your heart. And this is what we call the seed principle. And what are you planting in your heart is the question. Because it is something that you must watch over. Watch over your heart with all diligence. For from it it flow the springs of life. According to the seed principle in Matthew chapter 13 verses 3 through 8, what is planted, where it is planted, how it is planted, makes a huge difference in our life. So what are you planting inside of your heart? And this I am referencing, of course, what you take in on a regular basis. Through your entertainment, through your social media. What are you planting in your heart? Judas, no doubt, was planting something very, very different than what Peter, than what James, than what John were planting. Because he had a different outcome. You see, Judas was planting something very different. What are you planting in your heart? What are you allowing to grow inside of you? Hopefully it's good things. Hopefully, you are turning your heart to good things and not to evil things, not to wrongful things. For from what you plant here is what will oftentimes grow and become, of course, who you are. Many of you will start gardens this year, and you've got to constantly keep the weeds out. It's a never-ending job. That's what you have to do with your heart. You have to constantly keep the weeds out. Don't plant weeds where roses are supposed to grow. Don't plant thorns where corn is supposed to grow. It's going to choke that stuff out. Plant the good things, the good things of Jesus Christ. We read about also here in Matthew chapter 27 that when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders. When Judas saw the results of his betrayal, he felt remorse. Your King James Version says that Judas repented himself, which is a strange wording of the way we speak today as far as the translation goes. But the New American Standard renders it here. Let's talk about this for just a moment. The verbiage here is used only five times in Scripture, and it literally means to care after indicating sorrow for the past. Judas didn't care during his betrayal. So the wording here shows that he cared after it. During his betrayal, while he was planning, while he was plotting, what was he thinking about? Probably thinking about what he was going to do with all that money. Probably making plans to to get away from the disciples so that they didn't come after him. The other Greek word, literally, the opposite of this, literally means to know after. Indicating a change of mind or purpose. And this is repentance, as we think of it, in the normal sense, as we understand it. But Judas was possessed with a regret as to the consequences of his actions. For you see, this act was supposed to solve his money problems. It was supposed to give him his heart's desire. But the problem with money is that it promises what only God can provide. And this is what kept out the words of Jesus all those years. Jesus was saying, you know, I am the light. I am the one who you should follow. I can give you peace. I can give you what you need. And Judas, the whole time perhaps, was saying, no, money's going to do that for me. Money's going to do that for me. And that's what we do today when we reject Jesus Christ in our lives. When we say, no, i got something better to do on Sunday. i got something better to do on Wednesday. We just keep on because we think those things are going to give us what we need. Judas, you see, was not sorrowful that he went against God. He regretted what he had done. But he experienced hate and disgust of the worst kind, hate of self. 
and he goes and commits suicide. One that we can compare this to is, is Peter, perhaps, who not long after Judas' betrayal, Peter was denying Jesus Christ. He denied Him three times, and I wonder what Peter's mindset was like. Perhaps he was getting nervous during this. Judas not caring about what he was doing prior, not worrying about it, but thinking about the money. Peter, on the other hand, perhaps thinking of Jesus' words and how He had prophesied to him, you are going to deny Me three times before the rooster crows. And that first time he denied him, Peter gets a little nervous, and then next gets a little more nervous, and by the third time he denies him, here's the rooster, and then what does Peter do? He goes and weeps. He goes and cries for the sin that he committed. And then he changes and does something much different. Judas regretted his actions. Don't live a life where you are regretting your actions like Judas Live a life that you are not perfect, of course, we won't be, but we can strive to live as well as we can, but constantly in mind of our faith in Jesus Christ. Next, we learn from Judas' confession. Is there a way that maybe Judas said something great about Jesus? Yes, indeed. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 4. Then Judas went... When, then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. This whole time Jesus was on earth, people were trying to show that he was just you know, a swindler, he was not the Son of God, he was you know, saying things that he shouldn't be, you know, proclaiming to be, you know, this, this man of God, man sent by God, and all of that, people were trying to show that he's not the real deal. But what does Judas do? The one who betrayed him. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. The man who betrayed Christ, under no compelling power except that of his own conscience, admitted Christ's innocence. And this is certainly a great argument for the truthfulness of Christianity. As a man who was an enemy of Christ says, he's innocent. And he is the Son of God, and I've done wrong. So we see here, Judas' confession is something that we can all learn from. When we admit that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is our Lord and Savior, that He is our King of kings, but the difference is you have a choice to follow Him you have a choice to do something much, much different. And lastly, in Acts chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, let's read this passage. The last thing that I have for you this morning that we can learn from Judas. Acts chapter 1 and verse 24. This is, there is during this time in Acts chapter 1, some discussion of what happened to Judas. And the apostles at this point are wanting to fill his spot, fill his vacancy because of his suicide. Verse 23, so they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Judas, you see, went to his own place. This is an unsettling verse with some ambiguity. If you look into commentaries, there are various things said about the passage and about its meaning. But it can definitely be said, as Peter was talking here, that it must have been difficult for him to say, which was easier to say for Peter. For Judas has been sent to eternal punishment in hell, or to say he went to his own place. It's difficult. It's difficult to say. It's difficult for any of us to say anything. So Peter said it the best way that he could. Judas chose his path. Judas chose 
where he wanted to go. And we read this, this verse is mindful as we compare the two. Matthew 26, 24, the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man that if he had not been born. This is true of all who betray Jesus. Let us take heed and beware. Let us all learn from this lesson on Judas that if we are to be in heaven someday, we must be faithful Christians. We must be a Christian who is here regularly, who is serving Christ, who is being an example, who is following what the Word says. Let us not be like Judas in the sense that he betrayed Jesus as he did. But may we all learn so that our soul will no longer be in jeopardy. The only way your soul can avoid a life in hell, an eternity in hell, is if you are a Christian, if you are a faithful Christian. If you're not a Christian, please come forward this morning and let us baptize you right in the baptistry behind me and you can be added to the body of Christ and start living as a faithful disciple of Him. Or if you are a Christian and need prayers of strength or forgiveness, come forward and let us help you with that as well. Please come as we stand and sing.